Hello, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition. This is a place where we talk with entrepreneurs and other interesting people about how they're working through this challenging moment in history. Um, in the box next to me is uh, Sharon Chuta. Um, she's the founder of uh, Uoma Beauty. It's a cosmetics brand designed for people with all different skin tones. Sharon is a cosmetics industry veteran. She worked for LVMH, for L'Oreal, for Revlon before launching her own brand last year. Sharon, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Guy. <laughs> um, and we are taking your questions for Sharon. Any questions about the cosmetics industry or beauty industry or any questions you have for Sharon uh, on our Facebook page, uh, through Facebook, through Twitter, through YouTube. So please ask away. We'd love to get to, um, to your questions. So first of all, Sharon, where are you right now? I'm in Los Angeles. What is supposed to be sunny Los Angeles, but today's cloudy Los Angeles. So I'm yeah. in a very cloudy Los Angeles. Um, and and before we talk about the, the company and your business and, and so many things, um, how, how are you doing? How have you been kind of dealing with the, the last four or five months of, of this pandemic? Wow, it's been intense. You know, nobody could have predicted this. But, you know, I think that's a good thing about being an entrepreneur. Um, we always say every day you get a brick wall and you have to find a way to run through that brick wall because there's no option, right? So that's been the same thing. You know, we started this year thinking it was going to go differently. It's happened this way. And, you know, for me, I just sense judge act and I take each day as it comes. And, uh, you know, for me, it's just about waking up, showing up, moving forward and uh, everything I see as an opportunity. And this is a huge, I think this year, 2020 has been an opportunity to evolve in every single way because the pandemic has you know challenged us in ways that we've never been challenged before you know all the you know the 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 the, the you know actions and the movements happening right now is also challenging society in a way that has never been challenged before so i think i'm actually taking the positive out of 2020 that it's a it's been a challenging year but a time for us to all get out of our comfort zone and um and make changes to to our world our planet our environment and everything around us um, Sharon, for those who don't know you or the brand, you're originally from Nigeria, which we'll talk about in a moment, but but tell us more about, about your brand. Yeah, so Oma Beauty is a range of color cosmetics. We're a highly inclusive brand. I founded Oma Beauty because I was frustrated with the state of the beauty industry. I was working within uh, beauty for the longest time and just got frustrated with how non-inclusive it was. And, you know, and it's really amazing because now, you know, I'm getting a platform to really talk about the behind the scene, but that was my frustration. I knew that what was happening behind the scenes, what was, was feeding the front of the scene. So to still have an industry that we were in 2017, 2018, and they still were not catering to most people you know they were only catering to one particular audience and that frustrated me so i wanted to go and create a movement i wanted to create a brand where everybody could find themselves and do that with the most amazing products that are unapologetic they you know uh, like the products we launched we, we went viral because they set a whole new standard for the industry and that's what happens when you take inclusivity and diversity seriously so all my beauty is a brand that has been founded on inclusion self-love self-expression authenticity and really enabling and inspiring people to show up every day as their best selves. And all our products are a souvenir of that experience. And, and that's been our brand. And we, are, uh, we were very fortunate to have launched uh, with Ulta Support in 203 stores and launched in the UK as well with Selfridges. And you know, it's been an amazing year. We're only one year in the market. People think wow. we've been there a lot longer, but yeah. we've been one year in the market and continue to challenge the industry, continue to be outspoken, continue to be advocates, whilst at the same time having fun and playing with makeup and creating things that everybody can feel welcome and included with and and i mean the product line includes um i mean it's 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 lipstick yes, it's foundation um, exactly lipstick. color cosmetics which means like base products like you know what i've got on right now you know foundations it's like concealers you know so it's um it's um you know they, it's it's everything that that goes yeah. on in in a, in a complexion and i was i was um checking out the website last night and you've got this really cool feature on the site where you basically choose your complexion, your skin tone. Yes. And there's like, I think yes. six kind of general, um, and then and you yes. narrow it down further. And, exactly. uh, and that exactly. helps you pick out right? The, the, exactly, the because I, the concept of our, our range, especially our foundation was that everybody are different, right? And I think that's the yeah. craziness of the world. We keep pretending like we're the same, we're not the same. What your skin needs is completely different to what my skin needs. Yet every brand, even the ones who are claiming to be inclusive, will create the same product for everybody, but the needs are completely different. So we created six different skin families and then we customize the formulas within each family to target the unique needs of your skin, to target the, the way your skin is structured, the common concerns of your skin. So we put that all together in a foundation and that's why our um, website is built that way where you, 
start from what my skin family, which sort of identifies where you are, and then you go down. We've got 51 shades, so it can be overwhelming. So we help people really consolidate because once you find your skin family, you only have to select between six to 12 shades, depending on your skin family. We help you work out your undertone, which is you know all about the, the, the shade of your skin. Um, and once you've done that, you really have only three products to select from. So it makes it super easy, super intuitive to shop through a 51 shade foundation range, which for women can be quite daunting. Just for the record, I got olive. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You are honey, honey. I love it. Yeah, honey, <laughs> honey. Yep, I that was it. one. Um, yeah, I wish I had some this morning because I I had uh -huh. like a little spot. But anyway. That's yeah, another you know, story. Well, well, makeup is for everybody, you know, and, and that's, that's, totally. you know, that's something that we actually talk about a lot because this is an industry that also says makeup is female. Well, it's not. My ex-husband used my concealers all the time um, and he used it for his under eye and then like to cover, like when he would have dark circles, he would cover them. He would have like, yeah. you know, uh, imperfections. So he wore makeup, even though he was the most manly man. And I mean, a lot of his friends didn't know that because of just society is not ready for it, but he did wear makeup, even though he wasn't like super visible on the skin. Do you know, I think a lot of men do that. Like I, I, I remember like I've on several occasions, especially when like we've done family photos, I've taken my my wife's concealer and just like mm -hmm. put it under my, I've done that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm exactly. admit that. I mean, I think a lot of men do that. Yeah, no, but they do, but they just hide it and don't talk about it because society yeah. sort of like, you know, pitches all people and goes, oh, makeup is a thing that chicks use and it's not for men. And it's like, no, it's for everybody. And you know, you say, with women, we're not there trying to, people think you use makeup to be pretty. We're not there trying to be pretty. We're just expressing ourselves, right? And um, and that's all we do. And it's the same thing, like anybody who's on TV, they, they use makeup, like they put it to mattify the skin, you know, to accentuate certain parts so that the camera can catch it better. So every man who's on TV, it says use makeup. So, uh, so yes. <laughs> Um, by the way, we're taking your questions for Sharon um, through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So please ask away. Um, Sharon, you, you grew up in Nigeria, um, I think in, in Lagos, right? Is that right? Uh, well, I grew up in a lot of parts of Nigeria. My right. family moved around a lot because my dad was a hotelier. So I, grew, I spent a lot of time in Lagos. I spent time in Wari. Um, I consider myself a worry girl. People don't know where worry is. It's like, I joke about people. I'm like, you know Harlem. They're like, yeah. I'm like, um, or you know Compton, yes. Okay, make it like, 30 times more extreme and you've got worry. Like it is, it is hardcore. It is really like so much culture. It is street. It is, it is wild. And uh, that was where I spent a lot of, most of my, um, it was a city where I spent the longest time, but it's an unknown place on the map, but it's very, very notorious for just being that place. I read about, I read um, a really great article about, about you and it talked about how like really early on, like as a, as a, you know, just right out of college, you, you got into, um, into working with Revlon and I guess yeah. it kind of stemmed from, from your childhood where you were frustrated that you couldn't get the products, Revlon products in, in Nigeria. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. I think, you know, for me, one of the most common themes in my life is always standing up. For, for what I believe is right and always fighting to for a better world, you know, from being expelled when I was in high school for mobilizing everybody to go on strike because it was, the conditions weren't great. And I had to, you know, mobilize everybody to go on strike. So they went on strike, what we wanted, they got it, but I was the scapegoat, so as I labeled the troublemaker, right? So, you know, leaving college and going, hey, why, you know, I was a musician at the time because at that time I thought I wanted to be the upset. Uh, but that's a, that's a whole different story. But then going, why don't we have good color cosmetics in Nigeria? And I reached out to all the brands and Revlon was the only one who responded positively. Um, and they've been trying to come into the country for 15 years and they could and it took like the craziness of a teenager not knowing how to take no for an answer to finally get them into the country after 15 years of trying. And that was how I got into the beauty space um, because, you know, it, it really showed me that I had two sides to me in terms of I'd always been um, very academic. And, but I'd also been very, very artistic, which is why I wanted to go for a, a musical career um, at the uh, absolute behest of my, my parents were absolutely devastated with that silly decision. You, they were like, you could, I finished high school at 15. So they were like, wow. you could have a PhD at 19. You know, you were that clever. I was one of those gifted kids. And then you decide that, yeah, I'm just gonna go be a singer and twerk, you know? So, uh, so beauty gave me a home to put those two things together in terms of the creativity and the academics of it all. And you did eventually get Revlon in into Nigeria. You w yes. went on to work for L'Oreal. You worked for yes. LVMH. Um, I think yes. you ran operations for Benefit. That that I think a San Francisco-based yes, cosmetics company. Um, yes. In I, I I read that you quoted an article talking about how even now, like in in African countries, the cosmetics available are really kind of 
designed for for lighter skin tones. Um, yeah, even absolutely. now. Absolutely. You know, I did a whole series on my Instagram stories once where I was traveling. And as I was traveling, I was showing them what was available in South Africa. In South Africa, you go into the department stores and you can't find dark shades. And that's ridiculous. You know, it's just completely ridiculous. A lot of countries that are African countries you still can't find it. And what's also sad is because of the effect of colonialism, even in Africa, the standard of beauty is still very Anglo Anglo centric. It's still yeah. fair skin, it's still straight hair. The biggest skincare selling um, product, skincare product in Africa is skin bleaching products. You right. know, out here is anti aging. There is skin bleaching because everybody wants to be lighter. You won't have some people putting their music, some music put in the music to go oh light skin girls and how they prefer light skin girls you hear men talk about this quite openly that i love my girls to be light skin so all the girls that you know going to bleach and this was actually a big problem because you started having products with mercury in them you know because it is the quickest way to like bleach yourself mercury uh, high doses of hydroquinine like really formaldehyde really bad stuff that we're not allowed to sell here people were making them and sending them down there and just having people you know you know uh, um health be at risk so it's it's really sad and i remember growing up even in nigeria people had to use like white talcum powder as a face base because there was nothing you know um and then there was like three shades of what we used to call pancake pancake is the original foundation made by max factor it used right. to be called pancake yeah right three shades and everybody would rub it and look orangey and look crazy and that was yeah. what was available so it's it's crazy when you think about it i mean it's so cool that that like your experiences led you to founding this company last year um yes. and and here we are right five months i think five months into the pandemic i'm losing track of time is it friday i don't even know we're what day of the week it is like 10 years into the pandemic would be a more appropriate statement right <laughs> how um how is your business doing i mean i mean i i know a lot of it's direct to consumer but a lot of it is in stores yes and, um you know in fact in beauty stores how how are you guys doing i know you're still a small company i think yes. you've got about 10 or 15 employees Yes. How are you? How are you doing right now? Yes, you know, at the moment we're twelve people um, who are left. You know, we were a much bigger team last year, and we shrunk it down strategically this year because last year we were growing way too quickly for my liking. Like we were just, you know, it, it felt like it was it got frantic, you know, and I felt yeah. like we had to take a pause, slow down, and build the foundation of the brand properly. Because if you don't build a foundation, all the growth that you you get is going to collapse at some point. And I'm, yeah. I'm trying to, it's a, for me, it's always a marathon, not a sprint. So I deliberately shrunk the size of my team. Um, most of my business actually comes from retail. Um, so because, I mean, we, we launched 203 auto stores in Selfridges, you know, in Oxford Street, which is a massive business yeah. for us. So yeah. most of our business actually came from retail. And one of the challenges we had was when we launched, because we launched straight into the retailers, <clears throat> the retailers' names almost overshadowed the brand name. You know, so everybody knew Sharon, uh, Alma Beauty, Ulta. That was sort of what they knew, right? So people were all going, even on, on .com, they were going buy on Ulta.com, not our website. So that was a, an issue that we had coming into this year that right. in a way the pandemic has addressed for us because all of a sudden people started seeing us as an entity outside uh, um, Ulta or Selfridges or all our retail partners. And now we now have a business where right now my .com is now over 70%, almost 80% of wow. my business. So, so it's really shifted the dynamic of things. And, and it's so interesting for us because what's happened to us in the end is it's allowed us to get more intimate with our customer, give them a better experience because they're coming directly to us. Yeah. And that has really driven a lot of growth. So we are um, out.com, like even as of this month, is making way more money than wow. any of our retailers used to make, even in their stores. Wow. So, um, so, so it's been so like interesting. Yeah, it's been interesting because it's really allowed people to see us for who we are with outside the shadow of the retailer to right. actually go who is all my beauty as a brand what are they you know it's allowed me to get more intimate with my customers you know i go on ig lives now you know so they're getting to know me whereas before i was so busy i was always on planes i did not have time to do interviews yeah. or, or or be on live or, or have the level of intimacy that i now have with my customers that's interesting yeah so ulta and and selfridges huge distribution platforms but now of course yeah. it's all through the, the the website we're getting a bunch of questions um I, I'm Gregory Reyes asked a question about how COVID impacted your business um and, and so thank you for that question um Gregory a lot of questions about the cosmetics this is from Maria Flores um do your products have instructions in other languages specifically in Spanish 
Well, yes, everything even on the product packaging is written in Spanish, French, and English um, for now. And then we're expanding um, later in the year to have even more languages as we move into Europe. Uh, we had the Europe expansion plan that has sort of been kabushed because of the COVID pandemic. And so we're slowing down a little bit. Same thing with Middle East. We're supposed to go into the Middle East later this year. And so right now we've just pushed global expansion into, into next year. And, and people are going to get to see a lot more of us in terms of more translations, you know, and even like we started to focus on things to make even our product more accessible for people with any imper uh, imperatives. So, so yeah. Are your, this is from Lisa Norris, um, are your products SPF rated and waterproof? Um, well, waterproof, yes. SPF, I make a point not to put SPF in my products. Um, for instance, our foundation rate does not have SPF in for two reasons. Once you infuse SPF into a product, it becomes very hard to perform on dark skin because it's a white base, right? Oh. And for me, anything that alters a product to make it non-inclusive, because this is the compromise companies have had to make. And that's why they only make the light shades because, oh. you know, once you put in SPF, it makes changes the base white. So when you're going to really like from my skin complexion, it would be okay, right? Because of our formula. But when you get into the real deep shade, it starts throwing back this gray kind of flashback that I don't like. So I don't put it in there. And I also think another thing about SPF is a very personal thing. People don't realize this, you know, um, it's a very personal thing. And once again, because we create products by skin families, the SPF needs for, for instance, really fair skin is different to the SPF need for dark skin. SPF need also changes based on what skincare you're using. Do you use retinols? Do you use any uh, product that, you know, counter the sun that would change your requirements? So I think that people should always buy the SPF separately to their products. And I know people want to do it for convenience, but it's really critical because SPF is so unique to what you doing with your skin. And a lot of times it's gimmick, like products will have 15 SPF right. and it's a waste of my time because I need 50 for me because I use retinols, right? So then right. for me, I just rather the product didn't put it in and make it gray. I'd rather just use the SPF I'm gonna use anyway and then use the products independently. And as we just learned on how I built this recent episode we did on Super Goop, the, the sun, sunscreen right, brand, yes. you, have to, you have to apply it like a lot, a lot. You can't just put it on in the morning and that's it. Like you've got to put it on every couple hours. Every two hours, exactly. And people don't know that. So I'm actually yeah. developing an SPF that is because when you wear cold cosmetics, this is the this is a shamble of it, right? If you're a woman who wears makeup or a man who wears makeup, you put on SPF in the morning, right? And you yeah. feel really protected for the day. But that thing only lasts two hours. That's yeah. it. Yeah. After two hours, you're not protected. So the best one, if you've already worn makeup, you cannot then take more SPF and start gliding over your, you know, like right now my face with highlighter and everything. You're not going to glide it in. And so one right. of the things you're developing is a spray from SPF uh, that you can just spray on top of your skin over your makeup. It sets your makeup and you can continue applying it through the day. And it will also keep mattifying your makeup because it's crazy. Like people don't realize that SPF literally only protects you for two hours. Thank you for that question, Lisa. Okay, I want to turn to something that that kind of got you into the news um, recently. You, you issued a call to action um, for corporations to publicly disclose, particularly in the in the in the beauty industry, to publicly disclose the percentage of black employees they have, um, executives and board members, um, and you used yeah. the hashtag "pull up or shut up," right? Not for and, sure. And um, and you got like responses from Glossier and L'Oreal and Sephora. Um, tell me about, yes. tell me about this idea. Um, yes. ha how did, how did it come about and, um, yes. what, what, yeah, tell me about it. I think that it came out of frustration. I was extremely frustrated because like I said, even the reason I set up my brand was for the same reason. Companies not being inclusive, companies not hiring black people. You know, right now in America, the black adult population is just over 13%. The black participation in corporate America is 8%. In leadership roles, it goes to 3.2%. There are only four black people who occupy CEO roles in Fortune 500 companies. Right. There are 615 billionaires in the country, only six of them are black. Every single level you look at, there is this economic um, isolation of black people, which is creating an economic um, inequality, right? And and that gap keeps going wider and wider. You know, during this pandemic, the billionaires in this country, the net worth went from $2.9 trillion to $3.4 trillion, you know? So, so the rich is getting richer, the poor is getting poorer. After the wake of this, this second wave of Black Lives Matter movement with the death of George Floyd, which was so personal, you know, it was it really hurt our community and the rest of the world. Yeah. And what I saw companies doing was performative activism. 
right? All of a sudden, they wanted to get into social issues. You know, oh, yes, you know, Nike dropped a commercial within 48 hours. Don't do it. Everybody was applauding. It became a competition for who can donate the most. I'm going to give 100000 to NAACP. I'm going to give a million dollars. And no point in time did they think about what role have they played in marginalizing people. So the same companies that you go through their social feed and you cannot see a black face, you, they do not have black employees, they do not have black executives, um, and they're the same people telling their followers that you have to do something, you cannot stay silent. So I thought this was a really good opportunity because they came out and spoke, right? Okay, you're yeah. speaking, put your money where your mouth is. And actually, effect change. Your companies are racist. Your companies are riddled with unconscious bias. Your, com your companies have so much microaggressions against black people. That's why I left corporate world. When I left, I was, I had a nervous tick. You know, I was so scarred. Everybody says to me, well, you thrived to corporate. You became an executive. I'm like, I didn't thrive. I survived. And that was what this campaign was for. It was, we have to stand for change and change has to start somewhere. And it starts with transparency and accountability because guess what? Only the consumers can affect change. And even though this is a human rights issue, because this is a very serious issue, we're talking about a human rights issue here, right? Um, only consumers can affect change because companies only listen to dollars. That is the only language they understand. They right. only understand dollars on the bottom line. They're not gonna do the right thing because it's the right thing. Nike knew the right thing to do. They've been marketing to black people for ages. You know, they've been marketing black people for ages. Yet 72.1% of Nike's corporate team from director and above are white. 77% from VP level and above are white. Can you believe that Nike, who are the ones who they own, they have the Jordan brand on the Nike, right. they did a collaboration with uh, Colin Kaepernick, okay, they right, dropped yeah. a new collab with Travis Scott, they have deals with Serena Williams and all of these athletes to attract, you know, guys are on the streets getting shot and they've got Nike on their foot. Right. They wear Nike and Adidas. Yet these companies don't provide for these same people who are doing the most just to participate and, and, and feel part of their brand. So that's what Pull Up or Shut Up was. It was a direct action movement that said, you know what, let's take this conversation public. Let's put the vote back to the consumer. Let the consumer yeah. make the decision. Do you want to see black people within organizations or do you not want to see black people within organizations? And the key message from this is saying, it's not saying companies just go out and hire people because they're black. It's saying, stop not hiring us because we're black. You know, right. there are studies that have shown the exact same CV. All they did was change the names. So they made some black sounding names and white sounding names, right? The ones with black sounding names had 50% less callbacks than the ones with white sounding names. This is fact. It's a fact that people don't want to deal with, but it is true. There is so much discrimination against black people within corporate America. College participation is at 10%. Why is uh, uh, participation in corporate America only at 8%. And now after this challenge, guess what? Now they're saying, oh, we're going to create industry programs with HBCUs. Why haven't you been doing that for 10 years? HBCUs have always been there. And all of a sudden it's this revelation of what needs to be done. So this was a, such an important and critical moment for us to finally hold brands accountable, for us to get past this performative activism and you know social media yeah. justice league kind of thing and get into real action. Um, and and I think you you called for at least ten percent of yeah. employees, executives, board members yeah. to be to be at black Americans. Ten percent, exactly, because that is a college participation. And to be honest, that's even me setting an unfair standard because there are a lot of white Americans who go through corporate life without a degree and make it to the C-suite, right? So yeah. technically, it should be in a good world. It should be at population parity. But for now, we'll make do with ten percent. That would be good change for us to see in the short term. Um, I read I read a quote of yours. You said, I haven't slept in days. I haven't been mm -hmm. able to manage my business. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm getting all this, because because you've been working on this camp, this initiative, this campaign, yeah. um, but you, you said it's all it's all been worth it. Um, it's worth it. It's completely yeah. worth it. This is like I said, this is a human rights issue. Everybody sympathized by seeing George Floyd. Right. And see somebody snuck the life out of him with their hand casually in their pocket. Everybody sees that part and everybody's talking about police brutality. What I'm talking about here is the cause. You know, police brutality is the effect. This is the cause. The cause is marginalization, right? So what has this country done um, since the Emancipation Declaration? They have put enormous amount of money into law enforcement. 
-hmm. enormous amount of money, ridiculous. Some people were saying to law enforcement, right? So you take people, you don't give them opportunity to participate in the economy to get the basic things. Maslow hierarchy, we're still at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, yeah. food, water, shelter. It's still yeah. what the black community are crying for, which is why we haven't even had the sophistication to get into the point of veganism and all these things of privilege, right? We're still at the bottom of the Maslow's hierarchy where we're just looking for the basic things. So what this community has done is push people out. Companies are not giving you jobs. When you go and set up a business, you know, 0.0006% of funding dollars goes to black women. Yet black women are the fastest group of entrepreneurs in this country. They set up businesses faster than any racial group in this country. Yet there is no funding. So it's starving out. If you look at all the black successful brands right now, most of them bootstrapped. It was, I started with $5,000. I started with $2,000. Yeah. Meanwhile, the average white male gets $2.2 million to set up an, a business. And we know 80% of businesses will fail in the first two years. Yet people are willing to give them $2.2 million. The average amount of money given to a black woman is $42,000. Yeah. That is marginalization, you know? Yeah. So when, when companies are not hiring you, you can't set up businesses. When you set up businesses, white Americans don't buy it because they assume it's an ethnic business. And this happened to me. Like I have a big counter in Selfridges and white women will run past the counter like they, they just saw a plate because yeah. we had a, a, a picture of a black woman there. So there is so much bias that has been so ingrained in this society and it's just high time that we have those uncomfortable conversations because for some people these are uncomfortable conversations for us this is real life one in three people in prison are black it is not because black people just wake up and want to go to jail it's because of the circumstances around us that starves us out and puts us in positions where we have to get desperate and do whatever we need to do and then you have law enforcement on standby to come and get you down for two ounces of marijuana and put you in jail for 25 years yeah sharon you know as, as you know, like our, I think our instinct as humans is to like see a problem and then find a solution, right? Like as an entrepreneur, yeah. that's what you do. Like you saw yeah. a problem in the marketplace and you wanted to solve it. Yes. And similarly with, with like this in, incredibly important, profound, renewed and new conversation around yes. racial justice, it's really been inspired by the mass demonstrations. I mean, there's no question yes. about it. Demonstration. Yes, I've been I mean, very proud clear. of that because it is so needed. It is it is definitely needed. Yes. And and it's clear, right? Demonstrations work. Like they yes. really do work. People yes. they they can change history. They've always changed history, exactly. Um when it comes to some of these big questions you're talking about, especially with respect to corporate America, you know, this performative activism versus action. Yes. Um is any part of you encouraged about the possibility of real change or are you still like kind of skeptical and kind of standing back and saying wait and see well i'm not because this time we're taking it into our own hands you know that's why i started this movement right we're not taking it like we're not going to just sit and wait and see you know i'm a dreamer i'm a crazy one you know i uh -huh. have I have to try and I wouldn't try if I didn't think something could come out of it. You know what I mean? Like if I thought this was all a waste and this was just PR for the sake of PR, I'll be running my business and making money, right? I would not be, you know, spending my whole time doing this, right? So I think for me, it's like, I do believe that we can affect change. I do believe that the consumers have the power. I believe that if they keep up on this, companies will change within three years, we'll be having a different conversation. It will change. Right. So I see a pathway to change because right now I'm seeing what, what's happening behind the scenes. Consumers mm -hmm. are not saying these companies are in shambles right now. They're running around like headless chickens because they have no answers. You know, most of the leadership teams are not diverse. So all of a sudden they're now looking to their employees who they haven't even promoted to management level saying, come and fix it. You know, come and fix it. And this is what they've been doing, pulling these employees into new diversity teams. And this has also been a frustration of me as well. And I've spoken about this. Don't take somebody who has a full-time job just because they're black and tell them, come and fix my diversity issue whilst doing your full-time job. I right. mean, that's not fair. And that's what these companies have done because they don't have the answers. And so we've been working with them on solutions. We've been working with them on solutions. I've been on the phone with CEOs, board members, you know, all the way through and just helping them through through my experience, you know, in terms of, and, and what they're seeing is that the entire ecosystem is broken. The HR manuals have to be rewritten, you know. Companies still have HR manuals that discriminate against black hair, you know, because all black hairstyles are considered unprofessional. I got told to my face by my MD when I was in my corporate life that I couldn't wear braids to work. It was unprofessional. It looked ghetto. Um, and that I had too much potential to be to be presenting myself like that. 
So I went 14 years where I could not wear braids. Black hair loves braids. It's a protective hairstyle because our hair gets to be super dry, right? So now I'm forced to, all, I had to wear wigs all the time. And that's why, I mean, the wig I've got on right now is the first time in three years I've put a wig on my head because I was so scarred by wigs. I was just like, I can't do this. So I got my natural hair out and I started growing my hair. I started using my hair for hairstyles so that I wake up and sleep as the same human being. So I think people don't understand the depth it goes to. You know, when I was working in corporate, I had to eat my lunch in my car because people felt it was okay to tell me how stinky my lunch is. Oh my God, you eat that? I don't eat that. Well, you know what? Quinoa looks weird to me, but you don't hear me talking about it. I don't walk into the kitchen and eat quinoa and go, is that quinoa? Oh, it's so weird. So, you know, sometimes the way uh, um, um, white America behaves towards black people, is almost like we're a species that just appeared and everybody's awkward and uncomfortable around, you know, and just misbehaves around. It's like, why would you feel it's okay for you all to gather around like eight people around my food? And all you're talking about is how bad it is. Like you will not ask a pregnant woman if she's pregnant, but you don't know how to like zip it. Oh, I live in Beverly Hills. People see me walking my dog and they walk up to me and go like, oh, you're the dog walker. Who's the owner of this dog? You know, you know, all the etiquette of, 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 of society, just like everybody's head blocks out, you know, and yeah. that is what happens in corporate is both the things that are done. And this is what we talk about unconscious bias, because people are not aware how it's making people feel. We used to have team building activity and it was, let's go blow dry our hair. Yeah, that's awkward. Um, or we used to have tanning boots in the office, so everybody could tan, and they were having a lot of fun. And I would go, okay, and just take my bag and go home. So one of these things in isolation is not a big deal, but when this is your reality every day, and remember, you pack up from work, you want to go buy a lipstick or a foundation, you can't find it. You leave mm -hmm. work, go home, people are talking to you like you are nobody. So when this is happening in every single place of your life, come on, like give us a break. Give us one minute where we can actually just, you know, you go into airlines, you're trying to check into business class, they wave you to economy class. Every single place you go, like I was joking with my friend, um, and he was like, you sit in first class, and the air hostess always feels the need to come and teach you how to use it. And you then notice you can teach anybody else on the plane how to use it. Yeah. And this is what we call unconscious bias. It's just things that people just do instinctively without thinking about it. And that's why we have to have this conversation because the only way to break anything you do in your unconscious is by consciously counteracting it. And that's why we need this to be, to be talked about. Thank you for, um, just thank you for, for having that conversation. I mean, uh, you know, you are, you're, you're raising incredibly important and, and profound issues and questions and, um, and something you shouldn't have to do. Um, the truth. <laughs> you would think in 2020, this, you know, but well, you know what was, what's been really interesting and proves my point about unconscious bias, right? When we went out with this campaign, we had a lot of white America who just felt really attacked. They felt like, oh, so are you telling companies now that white people shouldn't have jobs? I'm like, this is a problem that we have. It almost seems like you can't have a black, a pro-black conversation without people feeling like it's an anti-white conversation. Yeah. You know, I'm having a pro-black conversation. I'm talking about a human rights issue. And your response to it is, oh, my job is now at risk. But no, your job is not at risk. Like it is, it's mind-boggling that people don't understand. It. It's like, oh, but you're talking about race, you're dividing people. We are divided. We are divided. People are getting killed on the street. People are getting lynched right now in America in 2020. Yeah. Somebody was jogging and he got shot while the friends of these other people filmed it for their own pleasure. That's the country we live in. And you're telling me that me saying, hey, stop not hiring us because we're black is me dividing the country. I'm now the, I'm now the bad person. And that just shows you the level of unconscious bias that the people who are publicly commenting about this can't even see there's anything wrong with what they're saying. They're so uncomfortable with this. All they're saying is another black person complaining, another black person saying the word black, which is super toxic and missing the whole damn point. You cannot argue with data. If every single black person on every level is complaining, and now we're not even complaining, we're showing you the data. Mm. How can you justify that we're 13% of the population, but only 3.2% of the management population? You can either say it's because we're not good, the entire race are not good, but we continue to debunk that with starting up very successful businesses, right? So it clearly is not because we're not good or there is something broken. And it's a damn shame that people would rather believe that an entire race of people are not good, are complainers, than to actually take time to go, you know what? Maybe there is something broken. And that's been very interesting because to be honest, those are arguments actually further the case and further the point that these are the people who work for you as an organization. 
Look at how they're even reacting to the idea of, hey, how about you hire black people with that bias? And they're so mad about it. It shows how much is broken in this country and needs to be fixed. Sharon, um, when you think about this moment in history um, and everything that's happening, and you think about yourself as a as a as a core, I mean, you're, you're a business leader. You're an entrepreneur. You've yeah. got a, a growing business and a team and a product line. In addition to, you know, representing big ideas about the world yes. and about social justice. Um, in five years' time, when you when when we look back at this moment, um, what do you what do you want to be able to say about about how you changed as a leader and how you took ideas from this moment and applied them to everything you do? Yeah, I hope in five years' time that we are seeing real change, right? I hope that in five years' time, it won't be the whole, oh, what a damn shame, you know? I hope in five years' time, it's gonna be, yes, we, we all came together as a community because the irony of this, this is actually a unification moment. It's time for us to unite and it's time for us to unite against one common enemy. And that co a common enemy is systemic oppression, right? And systemic racism. And so I want in five years time to remember this moment to be, this was the time that the world finally came together, mm. you know? And George Floyd being a catalyst for this, that's why I want us to remember this time as, as the time that the world finally came together and made a change for the better. Because guess what? Diversity is good for business. Diversity is absolutely blinking good for business. And I want in five years time for even the businesses who went through the pain right now, but did step up and do the right things to be the ones who are leading and going, wow, diversity was actually good for business. I can't believe it took us so long to do it. And I and that's where I want us to be in five years. And that's where I want to sit back and reminisce about this moment with a lot of positivity and warmth going dead when things were difficult, we all chose to not do what was popular, not do what was comfortable. We all chose to do what was right and see how much better the world is for it because we did what was right. Sharon Chuda, uh, founder of Wilma Beauty. Thank you so much. Thank Enjoy. you for having me, guys. It's been a, such a pleasure. Um, stand by for a sec. I just want to say hello to a few people watching. I won't get to everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't get to everybody's questions. Um, Carolyn Rock in Egan, Minnesota, Greg Barber in Raleigh, North Carolina, Jared Middlecalf in Sweden, Mercy uh, Chep Courier in Kenya. Um, hello, uh, Lisa Norris in Philadelphia. Thank you for your question and many others. Um, we are gonna be taking the week off from these live conversations next week, um, but the break is just for a week, I promise. We need a break. Our team has been working nonstop since the beginning of this pandemic. Um, Starting the week of July 6th, we will be back um, every Tuesday and Friday at noon Eastern right here um, to talk with more incredible founders and leaders and thinkers like Sharon um, about how they're building resilience during these very, very disruptive time um, and, and fascinating moment in history. Um, but while, while we're away, um, in case you've missed any of these conversations, they are all available on the NPR YouTube page or at facebook.com slash how I built this. We've got, I think 34, 35 of these videos now um, and you can also hear excerpts of them on our podcast. So if you are a subscriber to the How I Built This podcast, you will hear that. You will hear Sharon's conversation. Uh, you will hear those and Sharon's conversation and others. Also, this Monday, we've got a brand new episode, as we try to do every Monday uh, of the show. It's uh, about ClassPass. The founder of ClassPass, Pal Kadakia, uh, is with us uh, on Monday. That's an incredible story. It is a master class. That episode is a master class on how to change your business model again and again and again. So check that out. Look out for that. Um, Sharon, thank you again. Um, Oma Beauty thank Products. Um, check out that. Check out their website. It's super cool. Find your skin tone, like I did, <laughs> and let me know if you are olive honey like me, and we can. <laughs> have I love it. No, absolutely. Thank you so much, guys, and thanks for listening to me this morning. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs>